Okay, everybody, before we get started, I just wanted to reiterate again that if you have questions that you want to submit to the school board, the auditor will take questions from 6 to 7 on the fly. So if you have a question, you can just stand up and ask the question. If everybody can't hear it, I'll bring the mic to you. Um, and then from 7 to 8, questions will only be taken from what I have up here on these 3 by 5 cards. So if you want to submit a question to the school board, the three panel members, I need those cards now. Please. Good evening, everybody. Thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. We have a pretty good crowd here, so we appreciate that. Um, uh, this Tonight we're going to have two parts here. So the first part is uh, David Graham. He's going to do a presentation and then also going to answer questions. And then the second part is uh, myself as the superintendent, Kevin Liming as the treasurer, and David Carpenter as the board president. We'll take uh, questions through, these, through the cards or things that were... Uh, submitted online. Um, again, we've contracted with the Dayton Mediation Center. Cheryl Alderman, Al, Alderman is over here. Alderman, sorry. Al, Alderman, sorry. Cheryl. How about stay with Cheryl? All right. That's easy. All right. Thank you. Um, so Cheryl's going to, she's kind of running solo tonight. Last time we had two people here, so she's running solo. Um, so a um, little understaffed over there, but she's going to do a, a, a nice job. So again, um, I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl here. Um, again, uh, I appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, information is, the correct information is extremely powerful, so we appreciate that. And I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl here. Thanks, Doug. Okay, so um, rules of engagement. First is campaigning is prohibited on school grounds, so I would assume that means you, know, you can't uh, talk about any particular thing that you, or person that you'd like to see elected. <coughs> Because it's my understanding we have a vacancy again. Nope. No? No? It's filled. Um, recording is being conducted by the district, and it will be posted to the school's website, school district's website. Um, all questions should have been submitted by now, and so hopefully you guys have all had a chance to do that. There are three by five cards up here that you can write them on. Um, and then... Uh, the auditor will take questions on the fly between 6 and 7. At 7 o'clock, we'll have the panelists. The panelists will not take questions from the audience. And so with that, we'll go ahead and get started with the auditor. If you have a question in the audience for the auditor, you can raise your hand and I'll come to you with the mic if you think that everybody won't hear your question because it's important that everybody gets to hear it. All right. Well, I've been doing presentations on how property tax levies work now for uh, probably two to three years, and I will say this is the only time anyone has ever... This is... All right. Now, still nothing. Give it a minute. All right. So, um, I was saying that this is the uh, first time I've ever been invited back to do a presentation on property tax levies. I presented it to uh, the Auditor of State's employees, I presented it to school treasurers, I have uh, presented it to different social groups, um, and honestly, this is the only time I've been invited back. So, um, it's important to, for you to realize what my purpose is here. It is to provide factual information and factual data. I am neither for or against this levy. I do not have an opinion on levies. Even levies that are going on in my hometown of Xenia, I do not express public opinions on them. It would be inappropriate for me to do so. And so I, I, I don't want anything I'm saying to be taken as being either for or against the levy. I'm trying to provide factual information. 
Um, I've been asked to try to simplify the presentation. I think I've done a reasonable good job of that. However, we're still going to have to talk about some concepts of property taxes for the numbers that we're going to go through later to make sense. If you have questions, feel free to ask them as we go. I consider this like algebra. If you didn't understand the first part of what we're going to talk about, then it's going to be hard for you to connect any dots at the end. So, um, again, I hope that those questions are related to property taxes specifically and not to uh, whether the levy is this, that, or the other, but we'll, we'll kind of, and while I'm asking you to stay on task, I'm also going to ask you to keep me on task because I can stand up here and tell stories for example. <laughs> Okay, so the first type of levy is inside millage. It's not actually not a voted <coughs> levy. It was established in 1933. Every taxing district can have up to 10 mills of inside millage. Um, inside millage is unique in that it, it acts like we would traditionally think of a levy. As values go up, taxes go up. As values go down, taxes go down. But remember, this is only a maximum of 10 mills in a taxing district. And the taxing district is a unique combination of government entities that tax an area. So if you're in taxing district L32, which is Bellbrook Sugar Creek School District Sugar Creek Township, you would have the township, the school district, the county, the health district, um, and the career center. Those would be the entities that make up that taxing district. It's a unique set. Those five entities are taxing you. They're in taxing district L32. So the, the converse is also true. If values were to decrease, the tax revenue on inside millage would also decrease. The next type of levy is a fixed sum levy. <laughs> fixed sum levies are voted to generate a specific amount of money. In this case, Bellbrook Sugar Creek School District has a bond levy that was voted to build a new school. So as values go up, the rate is decreased so that it generates the amount of money that is needed to make the principal and interest payments. Same thing, if values were to go down, the tax rate would go up because as voters, you said, yes, whatever it takes to make those principal and interest payments over the next 25, 30 years, whatever the time period is. I give you a simple calculation that, that really is that easy to calculate uh, what the um, tax rate is. And I give it an example of raising uh, $200,000 with $50 million in value. Remember, it doesn't matter why value changes. Same thing on inside village. Doesn't matter why value changes on inside village. Revenue moves in the same direction by an equal percent. With fixed sum levies, it doesn't matter why value changes, the rate is adjusted, and the revenue remains flat. So now for the complicated one. Voted fixed rate levies. So here, these are levies that how they react, how the rate or revenue reacts depends on the type of value change that occurs. So if we talk about a reappraisal change, that's where I come and reappraise a property, though the characteristics of that property have not changed. They have remained state consistent. A good example of this, if you take a 100-acre uh, farm field and break it up into 10 10-acre 10 parcels, the characteristics haven't changed. It's still vacant ground. It's still farm ground. But I'm going to increase the value of that because 10 acres is worth more per acre than what 100 acres is per acre. So in that case, that would be a reappraisal change. Same thing would go if the housing market increases and the one most people think of, I come along and reappraise your house and I look at what houses are selling for in your area and I say, this is your new value based on those sales. That's a reappraisal change. You didn't do anything, you didn't build anything new. Conversely, we have a really good term, a non-reappraisal change. Uh, Non-reappraisal changes, the easiest way to think of those are new construction. They, they are actually uh, a lot of different things that make up non-reappraisal changes. So uh, you could have the tornado that went through Beaver Creek. The houses that incurred damage as a result of that, that's a non-reappraisal change. The condition or the characteristics of the, that, those properties changed. And I appraise them accordingly. 
Okay. So, if you have a reappraisal change, what impact does that have on a fixed rate level? A reappraisal change that goes up will cause the effective tax rate to be reduced so that it generates the same amount of money it did in the prior year. Is everybody good with that? If you have new construction or a non-reappraisal change, then the school district, if it's new construction, will get additional revenue from that new construction. Okay, so now why value changes impacts this. And this is important because I hear a lot of talk about the reappraisal that my office is currently conducting. And what impact will that have on the revenue? Well, we'll talk a little more detail about that later, but you have to understand there are different types of levies that react differently to different types of value change. This is just a slide to give you a summary of what we just discussed. Just a quick reference slide, serves no other useful purpose, but I do want to go through an example. Uh, we're assuming the same scenario, a five mil levy on $35,000 of value. Again, this could be 35 million, it could be 3.5 billion, it could be whatever number you wanted, but because I only have so much area in that slide, I keep the number small. You can see a five mil levy on each of those scenarios generates $175. We assume that we had a reappraisal increase of 4% and a new construction increase of 2%. So overall our value increased 6%. On inside millage, exactly as we would expect, value went up 6%, revenue went up 6%. On our fixed sum levy, again, doesn't matter why value changed, our value went up 6%, our tax rate was reduced by about 6% generating the same amount of revenue it did in the previous year. Fixed rate levy, this is where we get it. still a 6% increase in value, but if you look, our taxes went up 2%. That correlates to the change due to new construction, and our rate actually decreased 4%, so that it, the reappraisal did not have an impact on fixed rate levies on your tax, the tax revenue that the school district will receive. Everybody good with what we have talked about in theory because we're going to get, get into some numbers. Okay. So one of the things that's important is what is the makeup of Bellbrook Sugar Creek School District's levies? So their inside village makes up 11%. That means 11% of the levies that the school district have move in direct correlation with value change. 11% is made up of fixed sum levies where these Revenue generated will remain stable. And then fixed rate levies make up 78%. So let's look a little bit at the history of uh, what value changes have occurred in Bellbrook Sugar Creek School District, and then what the impact on general fund levies only was. So I, I use general fund only because bond retirement Throwing that in kind of skews the numbers because, again, it's always going to generate the same amount of revenue. The amount needed to make principal and interest payments. So you can see in, uh, the, the dollar change in revenue has gone up every year, except for one. Um, there, there was a slight decrease that year, but in 2016, they saw a 12% increase. That was because they replaced the 5.5 mil levy. So they had a, a 5.5 mil levy that was collecting at approximately 1 mil, resulting in a 4.5 mil increase. That's the reason you saw the jump there. The other thing to highlight in 2018, when we did our triennial update, we the reappraisal increase resulted in a 4.7% increase in property values on average. But you can see that the tax revenues only went up 1.1%. Okay. So what will the impact of this proposed levy be on the general fund for the school district? You can see that if this levy were to pass based on current revenue estimates, 
there would be a 16% increase in tax revenue. That's not total revenue, that's just the school district's tax revenue. I will say questions help me a lot because when you guys ask questions, I get to take a drink of water. So if you have it, now's a good time. All right. So I have one over here, Doug. Yeah. Um, a recent mass mailing implied that the county auditor has spoken out against the school levy and politicized the auditor's office. Could Mr. Graham answer these questions? Does he oppose issue nine? No, but I don't favor it either. <laughs> Is that That's a political answer if you ever heard one, right? <laughs> Does the auditor's office take a position about the merits of a school levy? No. Okay, yes ma'am. Given the scenario in Beaver Creek and other communities, does the county have the ability to go to the state to recoup some of the tax money that they will lose from the revaluation of those properties. Okay, did everybody hear the question? No. Okay, I was afraid of that. So, um, <laughs> tell you what, what, that was a pretty detailed question. If I can grab the mic over here real quick. Okay, so apparently my mic might not be working well. Is everybody hearing me okay? All right. Given the scenario that communities like Beaver Creek and other areas have lost a lot of property value due to the tornadoes and other disasters, can the counties go back to the state of Ohio to recoup some of the tax money that have been lost? Okay, so from a property tax perspective, no. Now, there, so let's talk specifically about, and I'm not a foundation funding, school state funding expert, but part of the reimbursement you get is based on the value that you have. So ideally, if your values go down, then your state funding goes up. I'm going to tell you, um, in, in the case of Beaver Creek, just because I did, done a presentation recently in Beaver Creek. The new construction that occurred in Beaver Creek was greater than what the loss that they had due to the tornado was. So, um, and, and I point that out because that's not necessarily true in places in Montgomery County. Um, but for, for Greene County, when the Daily News came to me and said, hey, we're, we're looking for numbers, how much revenue is going to be lost by Beaver Creek? governments, and, and when I gave them the numbers, they said, Beaver Creek's doing okay, don't, don't, don't worry about them. Okay, so, um, I, I can't answer that intelligently on a school foundation formula basis, so, so I apologize. <clears throat> so if we look at what is the impact of this levy on your tax bill? So I, I, I and I will refer to taxing districts L32, which we've already defined as Sugar Creek Township, Belbrook Sugar Creek School District, and L35 is Belbrook City, Belbrook Sugar Creek School District. So if I use the terms L32 and L35, forgive me, it's the world I live in and it's the way I talk. Um, so you can see that if you're in taxing district L32, this levy will cost an 8.3% increase in your tax burden. If you are in Belbrook City, that would be an 8% increase. Okay, so one of the things that I've been asked is, can you compare the school district's effective rates? And, and I, I did this only for Greene County because it's the only place where I get the effective tax rates certified to me. We do include... So where Kettering City School District comes into Greene County, I actually have Kettering City School District rates, but you can see they, they range quite a bit uh, from a low of uh, 22 to a high of 58. And the other important part to remember in evaluating the tax burden is that there is school district income tax. And, and so that's one of the important things to remember. 
Um, one, one, what I run into a lot is people are tired of paying property taxes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the most common comment I hear is property taxes aren't fair. But I am going to say, if you're a township, that's the only way you can fund your operations is through a property tax. If you're a school district, you can have an income tax or a property tax. A municipality can have an income tax or a property tax. The county can't have an income tax, but we have a sales tax or a property tax. So it's, you know, in some cases, um, it's maybe finding that right balance, but that's up for the, for the taxpayers to decide what is that right balance and how much money should I be paying for the services that I receive? So what impact will the reappraisal have on tax revenue for school districts? Um, so obviously on the inside millage, which makes up 11% of their total millage, they will get an increase because property values are going up. If anybody thinks property values have decreased over the last six years, I'll I want to talk to you about maybe buying your property. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so on the fixed rate levies though, remember that rate is adjusted so that it tries to generate the same amount of money it did in the prior year. So they get new money on new construction, um, but 78% of their rate that the school district have are not going to realize any additional revenue from the reappraisal change. Doug? I'll answer to anything. <laughs> I have a question about um, one of the concerns I think with taxes going up in the, in the county is at some point people I, I would be concerned that I like where I live, over time my income is not going to stay the same, am I going to eventually be forced out of my property? With regard to Green County, are there homestead laws in play? And if, if so, at what age do they take effect, if at all? Okay, so one of the questions that was sent to me earlier dealt specifically with the tax credit program. So if I can hold that part of it off. Um, yeah, property taxes are, are <coughs> a, a big deal. I, I talked to, uh, I, I hate to be gender biased, but I talked to little old ladies all the time who said, I, my husband built this house. I've raised my kids in this house, and now you're taxing me out of that house. And I can appreciate what they're saying. Um, not to you know, be harsh about it, but to me, taxes are a mathematical equation. It's value times rate. If you want to have a debate on what the value of your property should be, that's a debate we can have. I can't debate what your taxes are because your taxes are a mathematical computation. We have another question, okay. or maybe more than one. Good evening, neighbors. Uh, we were talking about the revenue side, about this tax side, which I think everybody's got a good grip on. You're saying how it's done. But we haven't talked about the revenue side. At what point and how long does it take for the new construction components to get actually into your till. Okay, so taxes in Ohio are one year in arrears. So that means if you started building something today and finished it <coughs> by the end of 2020, we would not pick it up for collection until 2022. One, so the taxes you're paying today are <coughs> what existed as of 1-1-2019. If you built something during 2019 and completed it, I don't send you a partial tax bill for that house. It had to be there as a 1-1 of the prior year to pay taxes in the current year. So and that cleared, up, that cleared up a big question I had because over the weekend, I went through the Sugar Creek Township in Bellbrook, and I, I used your website for the source, but I only took four residential subdivisions. Only four. I did not count the Waterford Apartments. I didn't count anything going on in crossings of Centerville. Any of this thing on Carpenter Road, the six new houses over there in Carpenter Creek. You know, the odd lot scattered. But only in four subdivisions. 
I went through Woodland Ridge, Oak Brook, Cypress Point, and Highview Terrace. Since this levy failed the last time, there's been deed transfers that accounted for $25,553,292. If you take that at 35% assessment rate, on the books now, there's $6,986,000 already finished and in duplicate. Now, I talked to the people today in Oak Brook, and there's 20 sales scheduled for delivery prior to August 30. I talked to the people at Fisher Homes, these are the uh, Inverness Homes with the plant across from the high school. They have 60 new lots going in there. They have 10 new starts. That's 30 more. There's seven more into construction in Woodland Ridge. There's right now about $13 million worth of brand new deliveries in contract ready for delivery. We now have enough money in the till. Why are we pushing this a levy right now? The money is pouring into this place. It is literally pouring into it. I mean, I'm looking two two calendar years here with $25 million in new construction. That's no increase in the valuation recognized there for resales on houses. Aren't we kind of jumping the gun on this thing for at least two to four years? I, I, I don't think that question was directed at me because I will not speak for or against the levy. I will point out, however, when uh, we looked at what the value changes and the revenue changes were on that one slide, the values listed there are assessed values, not appraised values. So in 2019, where I list non-reappraisal changes of almost $10 million, that's the 35% value. That is not the appraised value. Yes, sir? If you build a $400,000 home, it pays 10 grand in tax. That's nice. But if you send one kid to school, out of that home, just one. What's that one kid cost the school district? That would be a good question for the school district. That'd be 10 grand, right? <laughs> so, Doug, do you want to be more clear about the questions that are more geared for you? I, I will try to keep them on point. Uh, that one may have gone on a little longer, but I think it was an interesting point because new construction is something that does result in additional revenue. It may also result in additional expenses. Um, those, those are two things. Again, I, I, I'm, I'm challenging you to think on both sides of the issue and, and understand what the concepts are and, and what the decisions are, are being based on. Whether you agree with them or not is what you get to do when you go to the polls. It's not for me to tell you that, yeah, they're, they're losing money on every new house that's built. I don't know that. I've never done a study on that. But I, I, I will say there have been studies that will tell you that new construction in certain areas are more profitable than new construction in other areas. And probably the most profitable thing you have is a farm field. One house and 200 acres. They tear up the road some with farm machinery, but short of that... They're, they're providing a, a large tax source or a tax source without a high demand for service. But ultimately, you know, it, it's the voters that get to decide these things. So, David? Yes, sir. So what kind of forecasting uh, do you do for new construction in terms of new revenues coming up? You know, do you go two, five years out, or if at all? I would look out the, the next year. I have to provide, I always say my job has never been to project what is going to happen. <laughs> Even if you look at my appraisal process, my appraisal process doesn't say what is the next most likely selling price for this property. It's based on past sales, what is the likely selling price. So when you ask me how far out I look, I look one year out because I have to provide the school district and every other government entity with an estimate of the tax revenues that I expect they're going to get 
in the following tax year so that they can start their budget process. Because okay, like the other gentleman just mentioned, there's a ton of construction going on here. And some of that stuff's going to be uh, completed in the next year, year and a half. And so that's probably not going to be factored into any potential revenues that the school district can get. Right. But I, but I will also say when, you know, I looked at that table that we referred to where I said they've got ten, almost $10 million of, of new construction coming on at an assessed value, that's consistent with the numbers that were, were being given. So I, I would say that yes, if, if, when I go to do my tax projection for the next year, one of the things I look at is historically what has new construction been, and then was there a factor? So in Beaver Creek, when they built the green, well, their new construction number was a little bigger than what it normally would be. but after so long, you don't expect that they're going to build anything else at the green, and you don't expect another green to be coming in. So there, there's factors like that. I, I wish I could tell you it's a science. Here's the formula we used, but there isn't one. Yes, ma'am. So you're saying that if a house were completed tomorrow, that the tax revenue would not be collected until 2022? Correct. Thank you. Yes, sir. Based on your perspective of the next year, which is what you said you tend to look out to, what is the estimated percentage of increase in the new construction properly? Uh, I actually haven't uh, calculated anything hard. I, if you were going to put me on the spot and say, well, my best guesstimate, I would shoot for that 2% range. Okay. And, and remember, that, that's one of the things we, we have to also keep in mind is that while $10 million of assessed value new construction is a big number, it's still 2% of their total value. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm in the back of the moment. I had trouble hearing that question. I, see, I, yeah, they were supposed to make sure that I repeated questions as they were asked. Oh, okay. I was asked what would the, uh, if, if I were, had my feet to the fire, what right. would I project would be the, uh, new construction projection for 2020, or yeah, 2020 pay 2021, and I said 2%. So you're saying a two, you're projecting a 2% increase in revenue based on all the new construction that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of, that is my best guess, because we are out picking up new construction right now. My, my appraisers, so the way the process works is you get a building permit, my appraisers come and visit, and uh, they see what percentage complete are you, um, what's the value of what you have built, what's the quality of what you've built, which goes to make up value. So, you know, we won't have new construction numbers probably until July. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, how do you, how do you um, see the effect of the property taxes on the current values just for Bellbrook Sugar Creek. Because I had a study run of over 200 sales where the median price uh, range from January 19th to December uh, 19th, uh, 2019, uh, the median sales were down 18.5.45% and the average sales price was down 13.3% from the same period, January 19th through December 19th. Do you not think that these sale, these uh, property tax uh, taxes that are that are that are on the ballot now, or that we currently have, is starting to affect uh, our community and the values that we can sell our house for? I, I have not seen any specific study that would support that. Um, but I mean, speaking from a logical standpoint, there is a point where your property taxes get to where you say, I can't afford to live there anymore. And, and um, I, I, I'm going to go to an uh, uh, area I probably shouldn't go to, and this is where I get myself in trouble, but let's look at the village of Yellow Springs. Property values are skyrocketing. Every time I raise values in Yellow Springs, somebody pays more for it. It's, it's literally... It's a high demand area. Um, taxes are fairly high in Yellow Springs in the village. Um, they have come up with programs to try to keep modest income people to be able to continue to live there. 
Um, has it caused their property values to decrease? I, I don't believe it has, but I'm also going to say, if you look at Yellow Springs and look at a, the high end, you know, the, the old mansions there on 68, they don't sell nearly as well as what you would think. But that, <laughs> my, my favorite one was we had a, what, 860 square foot, no basement, no garage, sold for $180,000. <laughs> yeah, follow up, John. But David, just follow up on that. Um, I think that this is a mistake that we keep on making, talking about this levy and the justification for the levies, that we keep on using other cities as justification for taxing ourselves. Now, the example of Yellow Springs has no bearing on what is happening in Belbrook Sugar Creek. The, the study in, that we just did was done by realtor Greg Black, um, expert in our, our community, and the sales are down. Uh, the median sales are down on over 200 houses, 18.45%. And our contention is it has everything to do with the property tax levy because people are looking for other communities with right, less right. and, and I can appreciate what you're saying, and I'm not dismissing it and saying you're wrong. It's really off point for what we're talking about. So right. I, I gave you an opportunity okay. to make that point, and it, it's really outside of my scope. We can have those valuation <coughs> discussions once I have reappraisal values out there. Okay, so now I've kind of lost. <coughs> what impact will the reappraisal have on tax revenue for the school district? I think we already did that one. So what impact will it have on you as the individual taxpayer? That's what everybody wants to know. And I give you the same wishy-washy answer that I gave you earlier. Inside millage, guess what? If your value increase is going to cause your inside taxes on your inside millage to increase. However, for fixed rate levies, it's not that easy because everybody's value doesn't change by the same percentage. If you live in the city of Bellbrook, do you think your value is going to change by the same percentage as somebody who lives in the village of Bowersville? I know we're here talking about Bellbrook Sugar Creek School levy, but county-wide levies are county-wide. So let's, let's just look at a relative tax example and pretend that we only have two property owners in Greene County, owner A and owner B. They each have equal value, total $70,000, and the two mil levy generates $140 a year. I come along and do my reappraisal, and I say owner A gets a 14% increase, and owner B gets a 6% increase. It had nothing to do with campaign contributions, I promise you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, sometimes I tickle myself. <laughs> So if you look at the scenario, new taxes, based on, you know, we reduce the tax rate to 1.8 mil, so it still generates that same $140 a year, but owner A saw a tax increase of 4%, while owner B saw a tax decrease of 4%. That's because their values, the average value change was 10%. Somebody changed by more than the average, and somebody changed by less than the average. So the person who changed by less than an average on a fixed rate levy is going to see their taxes decrease. The person who increases by more than the average on a fixed rate levy is going to see their taxes increase. That's why I can't answer the question. Even in August, when we're sending out letters telling you what your new value is, and you call and tell me, ask me, David, can you tell me what the impact on my taxes are going to be? I can't. Well, I can, but it takes me two or three hours to calculate. And I don't have that kind of time. So, yes, sir. Yes, I have question A and question B. I'll okay. start with A first. I have something I received that attributes you saying that property taxes are going to go up on average of 18%. Is that a true statement or not? That is not a true. The question was, uh, I was attributed with the comment that taxes are going to go up 18%. That is not a true statement. Okay. I don't know what they'll go up, but... I, I did not say 18%. The second deals with you estimate that even without a new levy, the schools will receive an additional $832,000 in funds for reassessment. Again, that was, we will actually discuss that. That was a model that I built, and the model was intended to prove something specific, but we, we will talk about that here in a little bit. Yes or no? Is that, is that correct or incorrect? Yes or no? <laughs> 
Yes and no. Uh, so it based on the model, but again, remember, we're, we'll get to, when I get through that, if you still have a question on where I stand on that, I, I will be happy to readdress that question. All right, thank you. So you're getting there. Yes. Okay. Slowly but surely now. But I love the questions. I'd much rather have questions come up. Is it about eight hundred and thirty-two thousand dollars? Okay. <laughs> there are questions about the overall process and timeline you normally take for reassessments. Um, could you discuss when you would normally be coming back to voters with the reassessment values? Yes. Um, so I tell you what, that's actually a slide too. So if I put that question on. Absolutely. So we're actually to the $832,000 question right now. I built a model because I'm a nerd and I love spreadsheets. So on this model, I used my most recent sales ratio report that I ran, which said I had a, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped the slide. We're, we're about to get there. Um, so my most recent sales ratio report showed that on residential properties, I'm at 83% of the sales price. On agricultural properties, I'm at 70% of the sales price. And then on commercial properties, I'm at 84%. So let's stick with just the residential model here. That makes up the bulk of the values in the school district. That I would project, based on these numbers, that we would have a 12% increase in property values on residential properties on average. Doesn't mean everybody's going up 12%. That means on average, that's what my expectation would be. Now, if you notice, my 12% and 80 plus 83 does not equal 100%. State law requires that I appraise properties at 100%, but I use a statistical model. And using a statistical model, I feel much more comfortable shooting for 95%. And the reason's really simple. If I shoot for 100% in a statistical model, that means I have just as many people over-appraised as under-appraised. People who are over-appraised yell at me. <laughs> I try to minimize that to the best of my abilities while still doing my statutory duty. And quite honestly, the Department of Taxation, who has to approve my values, doesn't want me turning them in at 100% either because they know we're using statistical models. Yes, ma'am. If, if you take my appraised value divided by the sales price, it's at 83% on average for properties. Now remember, I don't appraise on average for the city of Belvoir. There's neighborhoods within the city of Belvoir that we break down our analysis to those. That's the reason it's, it's kind of, when I say that 12%, it, it's a little difficult to to hold me to that because it's based on the total taxing district. So that's the value of the appraisal. Yes, my appraisal currently is at, on average 83% of the sales prices that occur. Kevin? I think, correct me if I'm wrong, it's important to know that this 12% is what actually happens. And I live in Bellbrook and my home goes up 12%. I have no increase in my taxes from Appraisal. Not true because you have inside knowledge that you're going to see that increase on. On top of which, remember, you're also comparing yourself to people in Bowersville who aren't going to see a 12% increase in their property values. My wife and I looked at a house in Bowersville at one time. It's a 20 minute drive from anywhere you probably want to be. <laughs> but it is true to say that the revenue you would get from the levy would not go up to the the revenue that the revenue the school gets from the levy will not be increased either the on the fixed rate levies and yes. the fixed sum levies. That's a true statement. If you're talking on the inside millage, it's not a true statement. The inside right. millage makes up 11 percent of the total millage for the school district. Yes, sir. Okay, 12 percent. That's great. The inside millage is only a portion of that. Only the inside millage is going to go up. What portion is the inside millage? Of all the property taxes. So it, uh, if you were, um, go back here, something to remind me where I was. Oh, did I pass it? Oh, I 
don't have that. I apologize. I thought I did have that as one of my slides. Um, it's 11%. No, it's 11% for the school district. I can't remember. It's 12% for either L32 or L35, and it's 1% more for the other one. I don't remember which is which, though. So, so out of that $12,000 that your value goes up, only 11% of that is actually going to go up because of the 12,000 because uh, that's the portion that's the inside millage. Yes, on inside millage, but remember when you're talking, this is where tax rates are set at the subdivision level, at the school district. Every school district levy is set. So now you're talking about the relative value change compared to the average value change. So when you talk about cost versus for, revenue. For, for case of uh, making it easier, I, I'll just assume we're all average. <laughs> and I realize that some will go up higher, some won't go up as much. So it's only, inside millage is only a small portion. <coughs> Correct. Okay, so. Um, I, I built a model, assuming these factors here, 12% increase in ag res property, 10% increase in commercial and industrial property, 3% increase due to new construction. Based on this model that I built, assuming that 3% new construction, the school district would get $848,000 in additional revenue. Now remember, this is based on a model, not on anything that is going to necessarily happen. I assumed a 3% increase in new construction. Why did I pick 3%? Because I was trying to prove to everybody that just because your value goes up 12% doesn't mean your taxes are going to go up 12%. The model was never intended to be a, used to project what the revenues are going to actually be. By the same token, if I would have assumed 0% new construction, the school district, but still have the, 12, the, the reappraisal changes that are in the assumptions, the school district would see $212,000 of additional revenue using this model, which accounts for about 1% increase. So again, I, I apologize for putting that model out there because I think it has been, it, I did not realize how it would be used by others. I was using it to prove a point that reappraisal changes don't equal that percentage increase in taxes or in revenue. And, and that was my goal with that model. I wish I never would have built that model. Um, spreadsheets can be dangerous. <laughs> Questions on the model? Oh, yes, sir. When would the schools realize the $848,000? Under the model. Under the model. Let's say okay, yeah, $200,000 no, 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 no. Yeah, based on the model. So the reappraisal is going to take place for tax year 2020, which will affect 2021 tax revenues. All right. All right. I knew what your question was. I just thought. All right. Yes, sir. So how long have you been using that model and, and uh, how accurate has it been in the past? Well, it, the model is wholly accurate if your assumptions are accurate. It's just like any other model. It, it's mathematics. I, right. mean, I, I know the formulas. Um, my, my problem, if I would have thrown 2% in there or 1.9% consistent with what it was in tax year 19, I would have felt a lot better about that number of $800,000 because at least then I would say, Look, I, I would expect that, yes, there's going to be new construction in Bellbrook Sugar Creek School District. If you don't think there is, then you haven't been driving around it. Um, but to put a 3%, that's higher than what any of, you know, from 2013 going forward, that's a higher increase than what any of those years have been, which is why I would ask that you discount the 848 or the 832 um, if it, and I don't know where the 832 came from. I'll be quite honest. Other people can build models too. I'm not the only one who has this magic ability. Um, I don't know where they got my secret decoder ring, but I, 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 um, 
so I, I'm not going to say the eight hundred forty thousand dollar eight thirty two that's that's referenced in the, the mailer. Um, it, it wasn't something that was completely made up. It was based on a model that I produced, um, and you know I just know that I would not come to you and say this is what the revenues are going to be, John. So, or Mr. Stafford, the 832 I number, I wasn't lying about because that's what you told me, so that is a real number, correct? That is a number that was based on that model that I think. It was taken out of context, sir. I, 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 no, wait a minute. This is what we're not your group, okay? And I'm tired of every time I come to a meeting yeah. right. that the vote no people, vote yes people think they can interrupt me anytime they feel like it. Shame on you. I never interrupted anyone Next question. I think that the model of God I, I, I do. That's the reason I apologize for ever producing that model. You know, the bottom line is, if they pass the plan, the taxes are going to go up. When they reappraise your house, your taxes are going to go up. Do we know how much? But the question that you need to ask yourself is how many taxes can you afford going well and good that over this 40 or 40 times that you're going to one thing about this wonderful school lab is when you put it on, you don't have a magic wand to wave it to go away. It's there forever. And, and I can tell you the same as I can tell you my first day in four years, they're going to be broke again, and they're going to want more money. So okay. the question is, you can look at his models, you can hear what they tell you. I'm just telling you like it is, and in addition, you're going to have a police want more funding. They're getting ready to build a new county jail in Green County. That's going to cost you some more money. So the bottom line is, is how many taxes. All right, and, and I agree that that's restating. I said it's up to the voters. Yes, sir. So, Doug, we've got a question that's been waiting back here, and I see some hands up. And I don't know how much of the slides you have left that you want to get through. So where are you on time? I, I am short on time, but uh, I would rather answer questions, and everybody has my resources. Uh, the questions and answers I have here, but if, if we, we might get through okay. a couple of them if they let me go a little over. I got a real quickie here. Uh, the model that you're using here, it's not the driver of the actual tax bill, is it? The, the model I built has nothing to do with tax bill. It has to do with tax revenue for the school district. Do you actually do you actually have that done by the guys like Tyler Technologies downtown, Dayton? No, I create my own spreadsheets. Okay, because you know they use an averaging technique. All right, we're not going to talk about the reappraisal. Yeah, and that really that, that really just skews things up big time. All right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Knowing even after the study whether it passes or not, we're still one of the one of four places in the state of Ohio that don't have income taxes. We're still going to need income coming from somewhere for the schools, just like every other district in the state, unless something big happens with state funding. So for us to have income tax in the township, we basically have to merge Sugar Creek and Bellbrook together, correct? Townships then, have no authority to have an income tax. And then the voters would also have to vote to approve income taxes. Um, what educate me on what that would do differently to help the schools if we had income taxes versus getting it from property taxes? Well, I mean, it, it, again, it's that balance between how do you want to pay your taxes? I live in the city of Xenia. I pay Xenia property taxes. I pay city of Xenia income tax. I pay city of or Xenia city schools income tax. I pay Xenia city schools property tax. It's a balance, and there is no right answer, and ultimately, how much revenue is what you guys decide, and how you pay it is what you decide when you go to... But would that help senior citizens and lower income individuals? Generally speaking, yes, income tax is viewed as a, a more fair uh, tax because it is not based on the value of what you own. Yes, sir. So, regardless of what mathematical model you use, I don't care if you use a Gaussian distribution or uniform distribution or whatever. All right, are property values going to increase? If there are inflationary causes for the property values to increase, 
I'm saying this because property values are going to increase regardless of what we do because there is inflation and people want to move to, to desirable, uh, desirable places like Bellbrook. Are they going to increase if there are inflationary increases? Money. Are your taxes going to increase or are values going to increase? Values, values are going to increase. Yes. I can tell you those inflationary factors yes. stopped at December 31st of uh, 20 or 2019. And if, if inflationary increases occur, will value increases occur? Yes. Potentially. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. If, if for a township, the township has no authority. Nobody so, heard that question. But the school district could come in and do a speech. Yes. They don't have to merge. Right. That is correct. The school district income tax is nothing to do with townships or city. Or, right. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Nobody heard the question. I'm sorry. The question was, for a school district income tax, would the township and the municipality have to merge? No, they would not. School district income tax is on the books. Um, it doesn't. Re it just requires the school district and the voters to, to pass it. First of all, it's not an income tax. It's an earned income tax. Interest, dividends, pensions, IRA distributions are not subject to tax. It Zenia depends. Xenia City's school district's tax is a income tax. It is not just on the earned income. Uh, really, but it's a simple clarification. If you got a house, four hundred fifty grand pays ten grand in tax. Ten grand in tax is six grand in school tax. Six grand in school tax is four thousand dollars less than the ten thousand dollars cost per student. So if you build a new house for four hundred thousand, four hundred fifty grand, it actually costs the school district four grand for each student that's there. So when you talk about this increase in revenue, that's step one. Step two is the increase in expense which exceeds the revenue, we actually lose money on new construction under $440,000 with one student's home. So don't look at just the additional revenue, look at the net contribution. It's not apartments. But, and that's where I don't know what it costs in Bellbrook Sugar Creek School District to educate these students. Those are numbers that they are the expert on those numbers. <laughs> Would you please explain what the owner credit, owner occupancy credit is, and why some people in Green County are not getting it? Okay, so there are three tax credit programs, and thank you for bringing me back to that. That was one of the questions, and, and I, I know you guys are sitting there going, "Was he going to go all night?" Or uh, <laughs> so the the owner non-business credit is based on the classification of your property. If you have an agricultural or residential property, you automatically receive that. The owner occupancy credit, you have to claim that house as your primary residence. You have to actually file an application to receive that credit. That credit is, it used to be two and a half percent, now it's two and a half percent on qualifying levies. Uh, qualifying levy is defined as any levy that was passed after or before August 1st, 2013. <coughs> So all these levies that we're talking about that are going on the books now don't qualify for either the non-business or the owner-occupancy credit. Uh, owner-occupancy credit, everybody doesn't get it because you may own a rental property. You may claim residency in Florida, whose tax rate is much greater than what it is here in Ohio. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why I just don't sign residential properties up for owner-occupancy credit. Yes? But I know that some of the people in my neighborhood who um, have recently moved in are not getting the credit. Did the application process change? No. So what we do is um, every time a property transfers, a residential property with a dwelling on it transfers, we send the new property owner an owner occupancy application. We also go and look at all the new construction once we put it in in July, August time frame, and any of those that are new houses, we mail that property owner an owner occupancy credit application. I wish I could tell you that we're 
foolproof on it, but I'm going to tell you, I every year, I've lived in this house for 10 years. Why didn't you sign me up for it before? I did my best to reach out to short of going door to door. I don't know what I can do. Okay, any other specific questions? I'm sorry? That is on your website. There's a link to get the owner. Louder. Yeah, yeah, the owner occupancy credit, uh, actually a lot of information on our website. That was going to be probably five, ten minutes of what I talked about. Go visit the auditor's website. We have a lot of data out there. We, we show you what the tax revenues have been historically, what the tax rates are, what the values are. All of this is information that I put out there because I want you guys to have access to this data. We have the tax levy estimator. Instead of saying, what does this levy cost me per $100,000, you can bring up your property and see specifically what that levy is going to cost you. We put it out there before every election, once the, the ballots are certified, we put that information out there. Uh, we have property information. If you go to property search, we have data on your house. Make sure the data we have is accurate. If we, have, if we say you have a finished basement and you don't, you need to let us know. If you don't have, a, or if you do have a finished basement, and we don't have that you have one. You need to let us know. You probably won't, but you need to. <laughs> you have a buddy of mine, and I think I told this story last time. I have a buddy of mine who might be over two, three times a year to play poker in his basement. Just built a new house, had an unfinished basement. He hasn't invited me over now for five years. <laughs> I'm thinking his basement's finished. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm thinking. Okay. Are there any other questions? Like I said, a lot of these questions and answers were, were uh, are, are in the handout. I apologize for not getting to all of them. I would like to get to the ones that are read. John, can I go through these real sure. quick? Okay. Could the auditor's office provide the actual cost per month of the levy to each property owner? I, I could, but... I give it to you annually, and honestly, divide that number by 12. So are you talking 200 per 100,000? Yeah, 199.50 per $100,000 is, I think, what the answer is. But if you go to our levy estimator, it will tell you specifically on your property what that cost is. But is that gross, or is that net? It's going to be after, if you qualify for homestead, it's going to have reduced, taken the homestead out of it. It's going to be the number based on the certified tax rates that I have right now. So remember, one of the things to keep in mind, when this reappraisal occurs, values are going up. This 5.7 mil levy is automatically going to be subject to a tax reduction because it's intended to generate a specific amount of money. And that's what it's going to produce. I got two more, John, okay? <laughs> Uh, we keep hearing in ads that the levy is going to cost us 7.6 something mills now and 250 per hundred thousand dollars of value. Why the different numbers? I don't know where the 250 or the 7.6 came from. It's a 5.7 mill levy to the best of my knowledge. And this next question deals with the same thing. How could the district hide the extra mills on the ballot? That doesn't seem possible. To my knowledge, it isn't. I'm not a ballot language expert. I haven't read the specific ballot language because my job is to certify the levy. Yes, John, I apologize. Well, I think the question I was going to ask goes to this turnout because the, <laughs> Really? This is just deal with your question. This is what happens every time there's an opposing view. John, John you've you already okay. made that point. So, go so ahead. the problem is, and, and you should explain to everybody, that the difference between the proposed levy that we had in May was that the 6.8 mills was going to come off, correct? There was a replacement levy in May. So yes, we, it was going to fall off. But now on the new levy, the way it was written, uh, we have the 5.7 mills that are on, but then the 1.68 mills stay on. So you take the 1.5, you take the 5.7 mills and add the 1.68, and you get to what our contention is, is a 7.38 mills that we're really going to be paying. I don't because know Because one that. is not like the other. I, I, I will be quite honest. When you are putting this levy on to be voted on, it is a 5.7 mil levy, regardless of what was failed in the past. Yes. That would be the way I would look at it, and I wouldn't look at it any other way. But they're not telling anyone that the 1.68 mils is staying on permanently. With yeah, 
it's, it's a continuing seven. levy. That levy they That's try right. to replace is a continuing levy, so, and it continues on the book. So, I don't disagree with that. So, so, so as a business, I would add the one point six eight plus the one point six seven. So, plus. John, do you have a question? Well, that was the question. Okay, so I think we need to move on to the panel. I apologize for going over, but for me, this is really good.